Welcome back to another episode of Off The Clock. I need to be transparent with you guys. I can see my YouTube analytics, and I know that uh, I have a lot of young men who watch my channel. I'm flattered. I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to react to a Jubilee video today that is about you all, tailored to you all, and I'm going to see uh, what you would say if you were actually honest. This is Jubilee if teen boys were 100% honest, so... This is for you guys. Mask off. These videos are just so funny. So intense for no reason. Oh my God. Weird story in college. My friend was a film minor and had to do some weird like short film. He was graduating the year before I did. So like as COVID was starting and people were like freaking out moving off of campus and you know, all of that stuff. And I was helping him film the short film and he wore one of these masks in it. And so we had to like go around campus with him like in this mask. And it, that's just an aside. It's just reminded me of that. It was very weird. In an age of call outs, culture wars and perfect facades, People can be afraid to express how they really feel. So we brought together seven strangers, protected their identities, and asked them all seven burning audience questions. What, what will be revealed be? when we take the mask off? It's like a horror movie. Oh, damn. Carl. I didn't know there was a teen boy named Carl. In if the answer is yes, you will flip on your light. Do you watch porn? I don't even have anything to say about that. I'm not even like upset. I just know that it's real. And so when people want to say, oh, it's not an issue. We don't need to talk about porn. No, it is because it's in our pockets every single day. And if you are not being real, about the impacts of watching porn. I'm not just saying that as a woman that's like, oh, I don't want you to objectify me, whatever. No, for you, it is bad for your mental health. It is literally bad for your hormones. Your testosterone gets lowered, but I'm not surprised. I'm glad that we're starting off this video <laughs> with this, I don't know where it's gonna go, but just know, like I take that very, very seriously. Porn is not something that I think is like some flippant subject. I think it's actually something we really do need to address as a culture. One, because of the impacts on young men. Number two, on the way that it forces men to view women and view sexual encounters. And three, because of the sexual exploitation that happens in the production of porn. It's accessible. And because it's accessible and it's accessible and it's there, uh, people use it. I'm one of them. I think most guys can agree that they have at least at some point watched it. And, you know, I mean, it's... If, if you can enjoy it in a healthy way, if you can enjoy masturbating in a healthy way, I think then like, by all means, go for it, but. Um, yeah, I do watch porn. Uh, God. Um, a lot of my teenage years, I spent a lot of time self-obsessing over it to the point where it kind of became an addiction. And it took until very recently to get out of the hole of, you know, paying for porn. I do watch it, but I don't like that I watch it. I'm gonna bring everyone else into the conversation. Uh, I said no. Um, I used to watch it a lot before. Um, I, I would say I'm a, I was addicted to it. My dad is in prison, so there was no one really for me to talk to about sex. So porn was my education on sex. That is... Uh, it's so dangerous that porn is how so many young people get their information about sex. And obviously there's a fault in our you know, sex ed curriculum and I have my thoughts about how politicized it gets, but obviously there's a conversation that young people need that is not happening. And I'm not saying this is somebody who, you know, is above this. Like I had a really good friend in LA who, you know, I think started having sex when she was 12 years old and was watching porn. It was like very flippantly like, oh my God, you haven't watched it? <sighs> Let me show you, like whatever. Like it's so cavalier even for women. So it's interesting hearing young men talk about it, but as a female, like, I know that it's prevalent with, like, my peers as well. And the fact that this is where, like, both men and women get their ideas about sex and what a sexual encounter should look like, like, I just, it's just bad. And my heart also breaks for young men that, I don't know how old these guys are, this is, like, teen boys, but one just said, you know, in his earlier teen years, so I'm not sure, maybe the early 20s, that at this age, you've already been battling an addiction? Like, that's insane to me. Obviously it happens. It's just like, are we really gonna take this lightly? From personal um, experience, it messed me up because after watching it so much, you know, I'm sure we've all been there where 
you're on page five and like nothing is right. Like you just, you're looking for that right video, but your dopamine like receptors and everything is so messed up at this point that the I same thing that would, would that. that would get you off wouldn't get you off anymore, right? I went so deep into it. Where me, I'm a straight man. I started watching trans porn. I mean, y'all, trans porn, I think it's the third or fourth, what did I say in that video? Third or fourth most viewed category in 2022? Because it was just erotic in a different way that I've never seen before. I needed more stimulation. Because of pornography? Yes, because of pornography. So I don't think it's just entertainment. It actually affects with your brain and the way you perceive love. You think that a lot of teenagers or teen boys are really educated on the effects of pornography? No. 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 And it's a conversation that we refuse to have because it's still taboo, even though you can literally access it at any given moment. It's either taboo, or if you bring it up, it's like, ah, oh, like you're stopping a care and you're being so prude, don't get in the way of my fun, whatever. No, this is an important conversation. We're talking about my generation, the next generation that's probably gonna have even more access to it. What happens when we get virtual reality porn? I think that already exists. What about AI? You're talking about how you keep having to make it more intense, get more simulation, get something new. That impacts the people you are in relationships with. There is a reason why 56% of American divorces cite pornography as an issue. Because if you can't get off anymore, if you need more simulation, you can't get it from your wife, from your husband, and you're constantly seeking out other things, where is this gonna take us next? If we don't address it now, I don't know when we're going to. Sorry for making that so intense. We're gonna hopefully go on to another conversation now. We really started off with a banger for lack of a better word, boys. You did not have to do that. You knew you did not have to do that. Have you ever cried in front of someone else? Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with the statement. I feel like it's easier to open up towards women, which is kind of embarrassing, but like, no, just quite frankly, I feel like they understand emotions more because they, they, really understand the whole crying. I mean, I feel like crying is sort of normal to them and they yes. see a bit as like a way to express themselves. It's interesting that you said that you're more comfortable to cry in front of women. I had a girlfriend and she broke up with me over text. And before that, I, we were like talking and I cried in front of her and I was being honest and I thought that's what you're supposed to do. That's what my dad taught me, right? But I guess she interpreted it as being insecure and she broke up with me and that, that really messed me up for a little while because. My heart breaks genuinely, I'm not just saying this for young men right now because you have women telling you that you're toxic, that you're too masculine, that leaning into your natural biology of what you are literally created to do and lead and act, that that is awful and you're oppressive, you're upholding the patriarchy. And then on the other side of their mouth, if you act too soft, if you're too vulnerable, if you lean too much into what they're asking, then they're upset about it and they're uncomfortable. And it's like, you probably feel like you can't win. Well, now I know I can't show any kind of insecurity, so I don't... No, she's just a bitch. I don't want, like crying Sorry, in front of women. Like, I'd rather cry in front of some family that I trust, right? That's uh, interesting because I'd rather find a stranger on the street and tell them everything I'm going yeah, through me too. because I will never see them again in my life. That's accurate. And I feel like they won't be able to judge me. No I'll never see them. I'd rather have a stranger think I'm strong and my family know all my problems, mm -hmm. so it's interesting. Feminism has gone too far. In the feminism movement, there's so much of uh, tearing down men or trying to put men back in their spot. Um, but if the women want us men to step up, then I feel like it'd be a lot more productive um, instead of tearing down men and telling us all what we're doing wrong um, than to, on the other hand, to build us up. I guess for the sake of keeping us accountable. That's common sense. And if you said that online publicly with your face, you would have so many angry girl bosses ripping into you on TikTok. Giving females more opportunities to certain things, I, I just think that's quite unfair. And it's like, you gotta put in the work, you gotta put in the certain, thing, certain things to earn these things. And it's not like women are granted less access to these jobs. I mean, I know there's plenty of women who are in business, who are doing good things for America. I just find it kind of intuitive that this whole feminist movement is advocating for equal rights in certain things when they already have access to them. I'm a feminist, I guess I believe in the equality of men and women. I think that when we talk about feminism, a lot of it boils down to employment. I think that the, the bringing down of men, you guys keep on saying bringing down men and shaming them, 
I think that is way overstated. I have never been shamed for my, for my maleness. I think, you know, if, if you look at any movement, there's definitely going to be, like, a radical portion of that movement. I feel like there's a, there's a wall and we should break down that wall and focus on the yeah. human race. Yeah, not yeah. women, like not men, not Mexicans, not this. We should all bring each other up. I mean, that is actually equality. Shocking. Like, that guy was like, I'm a feminist. I do believe in, you know, equality between men and women. That is feminism. And in that sense, if we're just leaving it at that statement, I would say that I am a feminist. Before I learned about third wave feminism and I saw how far they went, I was proud to say, oh, yeah, I'm a feminist. I want to empower women. I'm like a strong, I'm like, I'm not some docile, quiet, meek girl. If you guys watch my show, you know that. I obviously want the same opportunities. I'm going to fight to be in the room with my male peers. But feminism has gone so much farther than that. And so I, I think it'd be interesting to have had a more nuanced question about feminism, I think, because there's just so many different waves people might not know. Like, all right, I can say that I think feminism has gone too far while still agreeing that women deserve equal rights, but not liking the way that they're handling things now, because it's just so complex. Uh, and again, I feel for guys who feel like they can't be part of this conversation, similar to abortion, where it's like, you don't have a uterus, you can't talk about it. It's like, you can't talk about feminists unless you're supporting us. But if you're you know, against this movie, you, know, you don't get to speak about it because you're not a woman. I've been anxious about my penis size. Three guys are like, nah, bro. I started watching pornography, I think around the age of 11 or 12. And we're back at another thing to the list. Self-confidence issues. And that's, you know, that's a very impressionable, vulnerable place to be in. So, of course, there's always these feelings about looking at your body. Yeah, and I think the competition is probably what affects me the most part, you know? It's the, the thing you're like, I know good and well, there's dudes bigger than me. And she says it doesn't matter, but it still plays on my mental when I wake, exactly. when I go to sleep at night. Currently, I'm not really, like, afraid of the size that I have because I am kind of becoming more confident in my body and the way that I am. And I don't really feel like it's going to matter nearly as much when you're with someone for 10 years as you are for like a one night stand. So I am not personally like that uh, uncomfortable with my size. Everything that you just said like is true and like you just need to become confident in, in your own self by knowing what people really look for. But like, it's hard to get on Netflix and watch Euphoria and think like these are like grown ass men playing high school people. <laughs> yeah. And you think yeah. like, well, that's not what I look like. That's an important conversation. Not just, I mean, Euphoria is like so sh like sexually explicit, but just in case people are unaware of this, like Euphoria, like they said, it's like 25 to 30 year old dudes playing high schoolers. You guys remember Glee? I think a lot of those were in their thirties when they started. I did the reboot of Heathers. I was the only person who was an actual teenager on that show and we were all playing in high school and they were like a 31 year old 26 so when you look at those tv shows just know they're not actually depicting you as an 18 year old a 17 year old whatever like kj appa in riverdale that's not what a 15 year old looks like it's just not and I get, I mean, I look at, you know, some women and I'm like, oh God, I, whatever. It happens to all of us. I'm just letting you know the reality of behind the scenes. They are not your age. And they are trying to, you know, create high school content, but tailoring them for adults, for like the female gaze of like women my age and probably older who are going to sit on their couch and, you know, eat a pint of ice cream and watch Riverdale and be like, oh my God, is washboard abs. It's not about the high schoolers. It's like trying to get women to watch the show. And while we're on the topic of sexualizing all those TV shows, a lot of stuff that's out there in the world right now is literally soft porn because we've become so desensitized to it. I have questioned my sexuality. Mm. Oh my God. Okay. I guess growing up, I was never one of like the um, jocks of school. Um, I always was into music, I was always into theater. And so growing up, um, you know, I was always bullied because of that, because I was being too gay or whatever. And I always hung out with the girls. And so um, I definitely did kind of buy into what everyone else was saying and their peer, peer pressure of like saying, oh, you're gay. This is how you're gonna end up turning out because this is how you are now. So 
young people themselves are saying that there is peer pressure about your sexuality. I'm just laying that out there for the people who are like, no, no, that just doesn't happen. You're just like, no, you are or you aren't. Being in that environment as a young person, especially when you deal with insecurities and you're being bullied and you don't really understand yourself and everybody around you is different than you. And you're like, oh, well, maybe maybe I am. Like, they're saying this, like, I'm so different. And, you know, if you end up being gay, that's totally fine. But it is worrisome that at a young age, this is what they're, you know, being peer pressured about. And now these days with young people, it's even more intense. It's like, oh, oh you like theater? You like sparkly things? You are probably trans. You're probably a girl. It's a slippery slope. Let kids be kids. And it's hard because... <laughs> Kids being kids is going to mean that some of them are going to be mean to people, and that's hard. Uh, so again, it just goes back to the culture of like the fact that this has become how we taunt people. With where I am now in my life, I've just kind of gotten to a place where I've grown to be confident. And, um, I know what my identity is. People thinking that definitely like it gets you thinking. You know, it gets you thinking like, well, like, am I or should I be? You know, it's like, do, like, should I be attracted to dudes because I like things that are quote unquote gay? No, you know, it does not matter. Then I guess it just reveals the issue that like, we've made certain things gay. If I didn't go to therapy and stop being like an anxious, depressed clump of a teenager, I'm guessing the people probably would have told me I might be a lesbian. I mean, my mom at one point, I've talked about this conversation multiple times. We were driving through one of the canyons in LA and I was sitting there in like all black, like my legs spread out and my Doc Martens being all pissed off about something. And she was like, you are dressing like a bush lesbian. And she was like, if you are, okay. But that's how you're presenting yourself to the world because you're dealing with internal things that you're, you know, really angry about. And we have stuff going on with our family and... Is this how you want to present yourself and be perceived? And that was an important question for me to be asked. And that was also in that conversation that I've referenced so many times where she said, it is okay to be both strong and feminine. You don't have to sacrifice one for the other. You can still be Brett. You can still love all the things that you love. You can still have the personality that like takes no shit, that is super loud and passionate while also being like, hey, it's okay to wear a dress one time. Literally, y'all, I remember going to Priscilla's Coffee Shop in Burbank, California. I walked in and my best friend of like three years, it was the first time she had ever seen me wear a dress. It was like right after that conversation. She was like, what the heck? Like that is how much of a shift I took. Because I was like, oh my God, like that isn't me. Anyway, that's just from the female perspective. Mine st uh, didn't stem from any kind of like extra like curricular activity. My stuff um, stemmed from porn, as I mentioned before. Oh, interesting that they've brought it up again as a root cause to another issue. Mm. And when I started watching trans, you know, trans porn, and it's weird, weird to say, but like I, I got really nervous. I got really, really nervous because I thought maybe I'd be gay. And so, you know, I did my research on it. It's like me doing that video where I took the quiz to find out if I was gay. <laughs> That was like, I had my own version of this, y'all, but it was in high school, and I was like, do I have depression? Yeah, Brett, you did. <laughs> like, do I? It was me at like 3 a.m. Am I anxious? Like, yeah, your parents are going through a terrible divorce. Your brother is schizophrenic. <laughs> like, your other brother died. I think you probably have some problems. All the stuff I would look up with saying, like, if you watch trans porn, you're still straight because they're, they're women and stuff like that. But I'm thinking, like, what would my family think? I've never sought out, and like every time I talk to one in real, a trans woman in real life, there's no like actual attraction there. So I'm still lost in the fact of what I actually am attracted to. But I guess I am still straight because they aren't women. Quite frankly, right now I feel happy with my sexuality, and I feel that it's not wrong to question your sexuality in terms of all well, in America. Like you're free to question whatever you want. You can question your religion. Yeah. You can question your culture. It's just society is the things that constrains those certain things to be what's normal and what's wrong. Yeah, I feel like there's just a strong stigma to to be straight, you know, like or strong like a more like a pushing you into it. That even right now, I feel the desire to like explain myself, even though we're anonymous right now. I yeah. feel like I've never been with like I've only been with like actual like cis women, but like so I don't I know that's like no one is judging me. We're all here to be honest. It's so I love this. Because 
obviously you're still dealing with like young men that have peer pressure and there's you know societal pressure but i on the other hand like watch you know the content that i do and i talk about the stories that i do where i like literally see that this seemingly oppressed class of people has so much sway over all of the institutions over all of our media our entertainment over all of our trends it's like that video i reacted to the other day for a comment section episode where this guy was like Maybe he was watching trans porn too. I don't know. But he was saying like, I followed all these trans women on Twitter and like, they were so cool and I wanted to be them. And then he ended up transitioning. He was like, they were just so whatever. So it's interesting. I I do think still that there is like a social contagion part, but I think it's like, we're not fully there yet because there are guys that are still like, oh no, I can't. That's weird. I don't want to whatever. But then on the other hand, I see like the social and cultural influence that these people have in the way that our institutions and our big corporations and celebrities back them just like blindly. Uh, it's just interesting. I don't really have a condensed point for that to like say anything against what he's saying. It's his personal experience, but I just think that's interesting. It's such a stigma that from the last you know 18 years of my life that in this moment right now I feel embarrassed and, and ashamed for something that should just be, that's just the way it is, you know. I'm scared of dying. Interesting. Um, I think of it as like. I'm, I'm extremely scared of death. I mean, I, I watched my father die like right before me. It's, it's a scary thing. They just stop breathing. And just the idea of like nothing is just extremely terrifying to me. It's like you don't really know what's going on. Like, are you even thinking? Are you even there? You're just a blip out of just space. It is terrifying. You, we don't know. And as a Christian, I want to pretend that like I know that there's, you know, heaven and hell. But at the end of the day, I genuinely don't know. I think that's my biggest fear i don't have a fear of like the act is it the act of dying of actually dying i fear being on my deathbed and regretting not taking chances that i think i should have taken um and not doing what i wanted to do not making as much of an impact so i think that is what stays with me this i don't think i've actually ever talked about this before (laughs) since we're all being honest here and i've talked about my teen depressed emo years now one of my like biggest things in my teen years was that my older brother died when he was 17 years old and he died a week after his 17th birthday I am the only one in my family who is younger than him so everybody else like moved on not moved on but like they continued getting older they were already older than him obviously it's a totally different situation for my brother Reed who was his identical twin. So he's kind of constantly going through life knowing that he's, you know, missing his person. But for me, I had a really, really unique experience where, you know, he died when I was at a very young age. So I went through over a decade where I was still technically younger than him. I was like, oh, my older brother. And I still looked up to him. I was still kind of following in his footsteps. I felt like, oh, I can, you know, I'll do the same things David did. I want to, you know, preserve his legacy. And then as I got closer to reaching 17, I got so freaked out. Um, I've had some heart issues. He died of a cardiac arrest. Um, And I've had some heart issues. Nothing really, really serious, but just stuff that, you know, since that happened, we obviously, like Spidey Sense, turned on. Um, And because of that, and because of the fact that he was, like, permanently solidified in time, I was terrified that I was going to die a week after my 17th birthday. Like, I thought that was it. I was like, I don't know. It was just like, I couldn't see life beyond that because for my entire childhood, I had looked at him as like the benchmark. And I've talked to some other friends who I have a really good friend whose brother also died, was many years older than him and had a very similar experience. I've talked to people who have lost their parents at a young age of like now they're 35, they have kids, they're doing things that their parents never did. It's a very, very weird and a very unique experience. I'll be interested if any of you guys have had that. But that was my greatest fear. And since then, I have felt a lot more free. It was not fun in the moment. And like the year afterwards, I mean, I was a mess. And still, like February and October, even though that's my birthday month, are hard for me because I'm getting another year older that he never gets to be. And then his birthday and then the anniversary of his death, he died on Valentine's Day. Those are really, really hard. But that was since then, I don't think I have as much of a fear. But oh my God, like going into that, like I I was a wreck that week. And I couldn't figure it out. It was like subconsciously I knew, but I was like, something's going to happen to me. I can't like, I can't move on from this. And it also just felt wrong. I felt it was like, I shouldn't get to be here if he didn't anyway. But yeah, since then, 
I don't really have as much of a, a fear of dying. I think I've, you know, at this point, if I did die, I've done everything that I have wanted to do in this time in my life. Like I've done everything that I could in my, you know, 21 years, obviously, like haven't gotten the chance to, you know, get married, have kids, do other things that I want. But I've crammed a lot into 21 years. So I feel like I'm on the right track to not deal with those regrets at the end of my life. But anyway, it's just interesting. But every time I thought about dying was as an old, as an old person. But two years ago when I started working as a lifeguard, um, this lady and her friend came to the pool and, you know, I have the music going and everything. She just starts having a seizure. And luckily, you know, I did everything right and EMS showed up and she was safe. But then two weeks later, she unfortunately had another seizure while, while driving and she died. And that's when I realized life is like, it can happen to anyone at any point. And if I just die and don't do anything with my life, then that's, that's what I'm scared of. I mean, as morbid as it sounds, death is a very, very powerful motivator. And I know that well because my brother died at such a young age that it's like from six years old, I knew that life wasn't certain or guaranteed. I was watching a TikTok earlier today. The guy named, is it Tim? Like Chichiro, something like that. He does like the day in the life videos. He's like super inspirational. But he wakes up every day and he thinks about like, what in my life is actually guaranteed today? There's barely anything that is. And if you think about that every single day and you realize you have to be you know, grateful for every day that you get to have those things, it totally changes your perspective about life and how much you can cram into your time here. I said that I don't fear death because I, unlike you guys, I don't really have an experience, uh, so much hands-on experience with death. Am I afraid of the fact that I will die someday? No. Um, but I think, you know, obviously the fact that it might come way sooner than you expect is, is, is a scary thought. All right, here we go. Do you guys feel like you can actually be your genuine self when you're like talking to a girl or hanging out with a girl? There's definitely a difference between like talking or opening up to like my friends that are girls versus like a girl that I'm interested in. Like obviously if you're trying to impress a girl, you're gonna be dressed nicely, you're gonna wear some cologne, you're not gonna like fart around her, right? It's, like, it's, a, it's a filter thing, but like when it comes to your mom, like your mom's a girl and I, I, I wholeheartedly trust my mom. That's sweet. That's good. I guess that's what it is. I just, there's a lot of times I walk away with talking to a girl I'm really interested in. I'm like, man, I wasn't just, I didn't just go up and be me. And then my best friend, right? He's, well, not my, he used to be my best friend. He's kind of a womanizer, but I see him get so much like, you know, success. And every time I've gotten success, he's doing things that he's done, which is just putting on the facade and telling them what they want to hear. And you know, in the short term, that might work out for you. And if that's what you're wanting and that's what your goal is, then, you know, whatever. But I'm somebody that believes that I, I just don't think you need to waste time on people. And that's a harsh thing to say because, you know, you learn something from every person that you interact with and you bring into your life. But your time and your energy is priceless. You literally cannot get that back. It is like the most valuable currency. And I don't see the benefit in bringing somebody seriously into my life that I cannot be holding myself with, that does not actually like me for me. Like you can go around and you can, you know, say things to woo one person and be like, oh, I need to fit this mold. I need to be more like this for her and whatever. But, you know, a few months in, whenever, you know, when, you know, shit hits the fan and those walls come down and your true selves are exposed... It's like, hey, it might work. It might be great. You guys might realize you're perfect for each other. But sometimes it's like, oh my God, why have I spent three months with this person that like now that I'm being real, we're not, we're either not compatible. She doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. Um, and if you're going in, I'm not saying it's deceptive, but if you're like putting on a show in a way, you're kind of setting yourself up for somebody, you know, not being there for the right reasons. And they're not trying to be malicious at all because they don't know any better. They don't know you. Um, and that's something that I always keep in my mind. It all always goes back to that, like my time, my energy, like for thinking about like death and that sort of thing. That's something I can't get back at all. If I'm choosing to spend time with you, that means I really value you. And I hope that you value me too, because we're both spending time together. So I'm going to be as authentically myself as possible. It's why I think it's really important that I'm transparent on the show, because if you're taking time out of your day, hours out of your week, if you watch all these videos, <laughs> if you watch all of them, I'm impressed. Why, like, I don't want to be a fake person on here and be duping people into, you know, watching some character. 
So I think it's so important. So I take that, you know, with work and with, you know, personal relationships. But I understand the pressure of like wanting to fit yourself into a mold. It's refreshing to talk to people and realize that I'm not the only one who feels a certain way about things. Is a uh, it, it, it's nice and it's it's a step in the right direction for me in becoming more more comfortable with being open and honest with everybody. I love that. I think just the whole open conversation, like this won't bite me in the end later, or like someone's not gonna listen to this and think, oh, that guy's bad. I have more safety of expressing my honest opinions. Mm -hmm. And whether those be good opinions or bad opinions, it's like, it's a better way to express one's true self without trying to be influenced by what high school is and all the people influencing you in high school because Frankly, high school is just popular culture, what people think is popular. And society in general. And I mean, I hate to say it, but you get out of high school and it's the same damn thing. Like, the peer pressure is even more intense afterwards, in my opinion. I mean, I don't know if I'd say more intense. But like, you have more money. Other people have more money. You're outside of these, you know, four walls. You're in this world with even more influences. That was, like, fantastic. I love that. And I love the fact that obviously we can talk about like broader cultural issues that might relate to political things or, you know, whatever. And the feminism question was really the only one that leaned more that way. But what I loved is that they weren't getting into identity politics. They literally couldn't see each other. This was truly men, young men, being honest about their struggles, about the things that they face on a daily basis exposing the fact that they feel like they cannot be their authentic selves and be this honest in their real life when they are, you know, when the mask is off basically because of, you know, the fear of cancel culture, the fear of peer pressure, not being cool enough, not pleasing women. It's really, really hard. And I know that, you know, this video is about men, but for girls as well, especially, you know, middle school, high school, it's a really, really hard time. But I do want to put special emphasis on guys because even though everybody else says that they're oppressed, at this point in time, like, I know you guys know it, but all of those people, they, they, tr they attack you constantly and tear you down like they say in that video. And so obviously it makes sense why so many men struggle and feel like their concerns are not valid and they cannot express that. So I think this is very cool. Um, I hope that you felt seen in some of this and know that if you are going through any of this, you're, you don't feel alone by any means and there are other guys out there and there are people out there that you know root for you and that realize that this is just a broader issue so this is very cool this honestly might have been one of the best jubilee videos i had seen because it wasn't heated it wasn't political it was literally just a raw conversation crossing party lines i'm sure crossing racial lines i'm sure they were different ages it was just a productive conversation in my opinion so i hope you guys liked it we'll have to do another one soon before you go, make sure that you like this video if you have not already, subscribe to this channel and ring that notification bell so that you never miss a single comment section or off the clock episode. We are putting out new content every day, sometimes twice a day and even on weekends now and I don't want you to miss a thing.